Daddy, Daddy, can you, uh, will you put my dress on? Nope, it's not going to fit me. <laughs> Adam Lane Sli Smith, everybody. This is Attachment Adam. I'm really excited to have him on. He's an attachment specialist, former psychotherapist, building this fantastic business and, and coaching program, et cetera, all the other kind of jazz, helping men develop secure attachment. Can we have a brief overview from the lion's mouth about what this is, secure versus insecure attachment, and then we'll have a follow-up after that. Hearing all these big technical terms, they don't make much sense at first, do they? Attachment is simply this. It is the way that your parents taught you if you could go to them to solve problems when you were little, to get your needs met, to feel safe, or if they either were unreliable, so you felt like you could never trust anybody else, you had to do everything yourself, or they made you feel like you weren't good enough. So you now feel like you have to constantly earn approval from other people, or you're going to get abandoned. That's what mm. attachment is. It's, it's that simple. And then it carries forward into all of your adult relationships, into work, into romance, even into parenting. It carries forward everywhere because you learned that lesson early on and you're still living it. So let's suppose that you're in, um, you've got these attachment, let's just use attachment in general. How would that manifest, let's say healthy versus unhealthy uh, for fathers? My kid is creeping around right now too, so I'm totally with you. Um, for fathers, here's what it looks like is there's something called secure attachment, which is you are going to be able to go to your kids. You're going to talk to them. If you make a mistake, you apologize. You, you seek out chances to cooperate with them during a conflict. You negotiate with them more. It's, it's what we would call the authoritative parenting style of I am, yes, I am an authority figure, but I'm going to work with you in trust, servant leadership model, mm. care, real care, and solving problems together so that you will grow into an adult who knows how to do these things yourself as well. We'll work together as a team. That's secure attachment. That's the goal. But the research shows that two thirds of American adults now have insecure attachment, which breaks down into three different styles, two plus a blend of the two. One is like we talked about anxious attachment of I am not good enough. Nice guy syndrome comes from this. I'm going to earn approval. I'm going to be the, the permissive daddy. You know, Disneyland daddy is, is sometimes this. It's, you know, your, your wife is constantly on you to step up to the plate and you just back off and you feel massively insecure. You can't ask for your needs to get met. But when you do things for other people, you start feeling entitled, like you have earned their love and approval. So they need to give you something. These dads usually will snap at their kids. Like, you know what I've done for you? Things like that. Um, or they might be approval seeking with their kids, which is a whole other disaster. And they just, they don't step up to the plate. These are very weak fathers, typically. They're not bad men, but they're very weak fathers. And they create a lot of instability in the family. Then there's avoidance style, real quick, that is, this is the emotionally absent father. I gave you a roof. I gave you this. That's enough. You know, I fed you till you're 18. It is, you know, that's your problem. And, you know, they assume the worst with their kids. They talk about how their kids are ungrateful. They complain that their kids aren't doing what they should be doing without actually really teaching the kids to do those things. They usually teach through criticism, really harsh criticism. Sometimes they just walk away. It's They don't know how to build emotional bonds. So they try to set their kids up to live in a harsh, horrible world where no one's going to care about them by modeling what it looks like when nobody cares about them. That's avoidant attachment. Then there's a blend of the two disorganized where you can go back and forth and back and forth. These, these dads, they're not often in the home because they're so chaotic that it, it's really hard to keep a family together. And a lot of these guys, they, they lose contact with their kids or they, they get removed from their kids a lot of times. It's not dissimilar to so a conversation I had with Dr. Jenny Prohaska on trauma. So she uh -huh. is a first responder specialist and she kind of uh -huh. goes into these super high stress police officers uh, nurse doctors. I mean, we just came out of COVID. So like that ent entire industry, et cetera, other kind of um, uh, professions kind of working in these environments. Yeah. And as she was described with things, there's like a, a lot of it sounds like just emotional intelligence, just being able to, and specifically there, let's qualify that. Not so much that you're aware of your emotion, but I think maybe a halfway of a mindfulness plus being able to intelligently interact with somebody else's emotion um, what are your, like, we're talking about trauma here. So like, 
how do we let's piece this together in the conversation? Mm -hmm. So as a licensed marriage and family therapist, psychotherapist for many, many years, and my two specialties were attachment and severe traumas and the way that especially that those two things fit together. So I was the PTSD specialist that when everybody else had misdiagnosed you, they sent you to me and we found that it was PTSD at the heart of it. And we found mm -hmm. why and how and how to fix it. Um, cases that, you know, people in their fifties who'd been deeply traumatized as children and nobody had been able to help them and figure it out before. So that was, that was my second specialty there. Trauma. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. If your parents teach you that nobody else is ever going to care for you or take care of you or help you, that nothing, no one's ever going to assist you in times of trouble, then you have a bad thing happen. A trauma happens, right? Mm. Your brain asks two questions, two questions that the whole of your experience with that trauma pins on two questions. Number one is what are all the variables that went into making this happen? And number two is how do I never get hurt like this again? And if your brain cannot answer those two questions because you are alone you don't know what the variables were. You're too lost. You're confused. Your emotional brain is spiking and your logical brain is down. That happens a lot with trauma. And you don't have relationships. You can't say, I would go to this person to get help. I'll go to that person to get help. You can't even really talk to people about what's happened because now you feel like people will take advantage of it for avoidance or that people will judge you for it and abandon you for it with anxious. So now you have, it's, it's, it's almost a recipe for developing post-traumatic stress disorder. And then your trauma response boils over because you're afraid of everything all the time. You are always scared. Of course, you're going to get trauma. That's what, that's what crushes your resilience. But when you fix it, when you have good, secure attachment, it grows your resilience. It sounds like most men, especially fathers, they're never going to admit that they're afraid. Like, especially in this lower insecure attachment area. <laughs> Uh, so they're going to feel it and then it's going to manifest this anger. Uh, and so like, at least in, in my experience talking with fathers and men, it's like that insecurity, that fear happens and it always ends up in a blowout because right. that is like the safe emotion that men can feel. Um, so let's, let's suppose that this is describing you and this can be something that you're dealing with, whether it be the, well, let's hang out with attachment, this attachment style. What are some areas that you've seen that folks can start healing through this? Um, that would be sort of the first question. And then I want to call back to a stat. You said two thirds of all Americans have insecure attachment. I'm really interested to know um, from the mom side as well, like what a father can do to see. Um, and then we'll, we'll take the, the fix it default as a, as a third piece later on. But I guess the first piece being, how can we sort of heal? Second piece being, what should we be looking for in, in mom's behavior that might hint at one of these attachment issues? Good call. Very good call. Remind me of that second one when we get there. Sure. Um, think of it this way. Let's take something you said. Something you said there was brilliant is anger is that spike response. Yes. A lot of fathers with attachment issues will find themselves frequently ir irritated, angry, frustrated. Anger is never a primary emotion. It's not. The reason it feels safe for men and for women is because when we feel the primary emotion, sadness, hurt, fear, our brain says, the other person is not going to take my fear or hurt or sadness seriously. I have to make them take it seriously. And that's where anger comes from. I will protect myself by making them take me seriously so that this feeling stops. That's where anger comes from. So and it's super, it's super Yoda. It's super, it is. It's super Yoda, right? Uh, it is. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. That's exactly hate it. Leads to suffering. Got it. It was okay. George Lucas. George Lucas had it, and he's and he's right. You know, that's a lot of that's from Eastern philosophy, but it's all true. It's true. Your primary emotions, when you do not believe anyone will ever take them seriously or ever help you stop the pain, mm. you, you, you must make the world take your pain seriously. And that usually comes down to the person in front of you. It might be your four-year-old son. I will make you take me seriously the way my father never took me seriously. This is super evocative of a theory. So uh, I made video games for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, one of the things I would always say was that we, we sold the fantasy, right? If you're, 
like me, if you're a, a skinny, kind of geeky, not super popular, I moved mm. around a whole bunch when I was a kid, mm. sort of child, an escape into something I could control, something where mm. I could, uh, what's the, the term? Fake my competency and, and derive some sort of status, even if it was virtual, which is the game that almost all young, young boys are playing, there was that escape into video games. And I was yeah. very aware of this, if this is what I was providing to, uh, as an entertainment, as an escape from, from the world. And so I'm curious here on this train of thought, and we'll get back to the second question later on about mm -hmm. how does it manifest in mom? I'm we haven't curious. Even covered healing yet. Yeah. <laughs> I know, we're not even there yet. But I, I'm really curious is, is that escape um, into video games, into social media, into doom scrolling, is that indicative of this hurt and pain? Is that related? Men, yeah, you've, you've got it. Men don't do well when we feel powerless. That's one of the number one indicators for male depression is to feel helpless in your life, whether it's to achieve a mission. Okay. or to care for others or, and which is usually part of your mission or to affect change in your life or to stop your own pain mm -hmm. men I, I get a lot of trouble saying this but i'll keep saying it forever men need to feel powerful in order mm -hmm. to feel at peace 100%. we don't even have peace without power and i say that and people say oh you want men to beat their wives no the power to feed your children during inflation and economic crashes that's power Mm -hmm. The power to raise a safe, protected family in a world that's going crazy, that's power. The power to stop your own pain and focus on your mission and drive forward and achieve things, that's power. Video games, I will level up and I will gain the power to yeah. make bad guys take me seriously. Mm. That's what it is. It's the male fantasy. Um, all of this tells us then healing comes from being taken seriously and having the power to achieve change in your life and relationships. So you have to achieve those two things. And most men feel like that's absolutely impossible. Most men listening to this, if you've got attachment issues, hi, I did too, I fixed it, you can too. But it feels impossible at the beginning because it's all you've ever known. It's all you've ever known is no one will ever love me. There is no hope. I have to endure forever as my power dwindles and I feel more and more unhappy and I must cope with video games. I have to cope with porn. I have to cope with drugs. I have to cope with everything, everything. This is why, um, you know, is it okay if we talk a little bit about sex here? Is that Do all right? It. I don't know. Do it, yeah. I don't know how clean this show is. Yep. Um, prostitution has been with us forever, but only fans provides a model where the man can provide for the woman and get personalized girlfriend experience and feel like he is taking care of her, which is part of the reason those OnlyFans girls turn around and post, look what I bought with the money. Look at this house. Look at this. The, the, it's In a way, it's men feeling powerful. Yeah, I helped her buy that. It's men having that experience in some ways that men need power. So, yeah. I did, I did read that one of the signs that, uh, women are looking for is that he is providing for that big luxury. And it's, it's this idea that the larger the gift or the more valuable the gift, the higher the status that, that's being conferred to her based on his, it's super confusing. I barely understand it. I thought it was a neat idea. But yeah. That it, it, it sounds like that's related. It is. I mean, wedding rings, um, you know, gold, diamonds. Yes, there's a diamond industry, but the idea is jewelry was wealth and financial safety that a woman could wear. Mm. And the more you invested in gold or jewelry or clothing or fine things, you were telling her, number one, this is what you are worth. And now you have a pile of wealth that no one can take away from you. So if anything mm. happens to me, or anything happens at all, you have safety and security. This is what you are worth. Here is your financial security. That's what it has been since time immemorial. We read in the Bible about people giving him gold. You know, he gave his wife gold nose rings and things like, why? Well, it's literally wealth that she is wearing on her face. And if she gets something happens, she can pull it out her nose and pay somebody for food with it or whatever it's going to take. That That is it. So it's, it's, it's not that every woman on earth is a gold digger. Let's not go there. But it is that it is comforting to be told this, you are worth more than this. 
And here is lifetime financial security for you, independent of how I feel about you in the future. Think of it that way. This is um, awesome. Okay. Um, absolutely love it. I think that the, the thought that was occurring to me was that that line of security yeah. all the way through from like physical security, like way back in the day, we're talking ancestors defending yeah. against the wild animals and the barbarians at the gate, et cetera, yeah. through to modern society with like providing for the house. I love the, the alignment of peace, security. When you were saying that, I was thinking about like a feel good father. I was thinking mm -hmm. about them saying, we're looking for the peace. And part of that is, hey, it's extended from you as the father, as the, as the, I guess, the leader and owner of your world, extending that peace, extending that ease out um, and creating the canvas, creating the space for her or the spouse and your children to be who, whatever, discover who they are. Um, mm -hmm. and develop that kind of aspect of curiosity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, think of this. Um, the difference between a, a, a woman with insecure attachment style, we talked a little bit about that. We'll talk more. But it, a woman with insecure attachment is going to want that financial security and proof for her because it resolves her anxieties and makes her feel safer if the relationship ends. She wants financial security and stability for herself if the relationship goes away. A woman with healthy, secure attachment wants that financial security and stability for her children and her grandchildren, an inheritance. So she's going to join you on a life that the two of you build together. It, it's marriage is, is not this Disney romance. The worst thing we can do is a pair, approach romance and marriage as if it's about feelings. It's not. Mm -hmm. It is the only the only similar relationship on earth to to marriage is co-founding a business together. You are co-founding the business of family and a life together. That is what marriage is and has always been. And if you approach it that way, then all the skills start to line up and you can make a, a great marriage. That's how you really filter out gold digger wives from she is a good, thriving, wonderful wife. That's how you filter out weak, passive, resentful, ne negligent, dismissive husbands from quality co-founders who are thriving in your business and working with you to build a mutual business that fulfills everybody involved. Treat it like a business. Don't, don't treat it like a bunch of feelings. That's the worst, worst thing. Worst lie that's ever been sold to the Western world is that marriage is about feelings. Um, I love it. There's a whole lot to get into it here. So let's, let's take a little, a little segue on this. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about sort of the um, first, like just the pop, pop culture representation mm -hmm. of marriage and sort of um, align, let's talk a little bit about what it gets wrong. And then we'll, I want to, as a second part of this, get into like, what are specific things we can do to ensure that, I don't know, maybe let's, let's, let's hang out in the picking the, the appropriate woman for the rest of your life. And we're like, all right, you've already made it, made a choice. You're married now. Mm -hmm. And um, let's make it work. I think that's going to sure. align well and bring us back to the healing side. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this will be a good conversation. It's already fun. So <laughs> excellent. So uh, pop culture, let's, let's talk about um, where that came from. Like, why, why does this exist? Why, why are we so focused on um, number one, the emotion behind uh, picking your mate? And uh, we've already kind of talked about the consequence. Let's go back very briefly. I promise it won't be horrible. Let's go back about a hundred years. Let's just go back 150 years. Let's go back to the industrial revolution when people were working about 80 to 100 hours a week in factories. Let's talk about mm. families moving into cities because they lost their homes during the Dust Bowl in the 20s and 30s. Let's talk about massive breakage of extended family networks, of kith and kin networks, of religious networks, of families being ripped apart so that you don't go work in your, on your family farm with your father anymore. Your father goes to work for 14-hour shifts or 16-hour shifts, and you maybe see him once a week on Sunday afternoon. Mm. Let's talk about that massive breakdown. People don't realize here in this country that before Henry Ford came along and created the 40-hour work week, the 100-hour work week was pretty standard for a lot of industrial revolution workers. I want to highlight that particular fact because I'm, I'm aware of, of Ford's legacy there and like how um, he had death threats from this. Yeah. And, a, and a lot of folks don't view, especially in today's society, um, and if you're a feel-good father and you have this particular view, which is that like business owners entrepreneurs, that kind of stuff don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. Go back to one of the ones that basically built the modern era of, of basically uh, on the backs of the industrial revolution Ford and yeah. know that he fought and sacrificed his reputation and did all these kind of stuff and built what is effectively 
the modern economy yeah. uh, by not sacrificing the health and well-being of his workers. And in yeah. fact, one of the early lawsuits here was the Dodge versus Ford lawsuit where um, uh, it was the business owner. This is the modern structure of corporate of corporations. The business owner, uh, the CEO, et cetera, who's on the board is required to take the best interest of the business first before the employee. And that was the Dodge versus Ford lawsuit. Please pick it up. Uh, uh, do your research. It's on Wiki. Uh, get that education. It's super meaningful to understand. And what Adam is talking about, if I'm going to paraphrase super quick, mm -hmm. is that as people, especially as leaders and as fathers, we end up adopting, if we have a secure attachment style, an idea of ownership and well-being of everybody in our environment. And so I'm going to cue that up. Go ahead, buddy. Absolutely. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about how families were completely shattered up mm -hmm. to you know, 150, 100 years ago. You had then the greatest generation, then the silent generation, the lost generation. They gritted their teeth. They survived through World War I, through the Industrial Revolution, through all those work things that just ground them into the dust, through losing their family farms, the Dust Bowl, starvation, desperation, living in tiny apartments with three other families. We returned, we, we went from family farms to complete filthy peasants cast aside to die. There are organizations that still exist today because nobody would take care of families. I'm thinking uh, the Knights of Columbus were blue collar workers that all they, they pooled their money so that when one father would be mutilated in machinery and dead, that they could feed his widow and children or his widow and children would die. Like that's, that's what we're talking about. So fathers worked to death. And then they fought in World War II and killed the Nazis, and a lot more of them died. Meat grinder World War I, meat grinder World War II. They didn't have love and feelings to throw at their kids. It wasn't, oh, I love you, buddy. Tell me about your day. Oh, the Power Rangers. That's awesome. No, it was, I am barely getting through, but I am at least feeding my children. They have shoes. That was an accomplishment back then. My children have shoes. They have shirts. They have one nice outfit to wear on Sunday or to special occasions. They have, you know, they, they are, they get meat a couple times a week in their meals. They uh, meat like, like, okay. They don't have to eat rat off of the street. They are able to eat beef this week. Wow. Like that's what fathers and to do that 16, 18 hours a day till Henry Ford. And then they were like, okay, 40 hours a week, unless you work two jobs, then it's 80 hours a week. You're back up to it. But that was fatherhood. That was motherhood as well, was grit your teeth and survive. Then you have the baby boomers who were raised with that. And the baby boomers were born in this world of give your children everything you never had. We are finally safe. We've killed the Nazis. We're prosperous. We're growing. Okay, let's do it. And the baby boomers didn't grow up with, I love you. You're great. You're wonderful. They, half of them understood, my parents sacrificed everything for me. Half of them got that. And half of them said, they don't understand me. They're just mean. They're horrible. Maybe their parents were traumatized, but they, they grew up without understanding it. Baby boomers cracked this world in half for that reason. There are many good boomers. There are many terrible boomers. They destroyed our society, ripping it apart because those baby boomers who said, I never got the feelings I wanted, so I will force you to take my feelings seriously. And they're still tripling the divorce rates in their 70s and 80s, by the way. Tripling. Can you imagine being 80 years old and divorcing your wife? I, uh, uh, so for the feel-good fathers out there, uh, the, the, whenever I think of divorce, this, this is what I think of, right? You're, when you get married uh, in the United States, Canada, I'm a Canadian, now I'm a Canadian-American, um, you're in a church, you're in front of your family giving your word to take care of somebody you're in front of her family, giving your word to take care of somebody. And, and since we're basically in a Christian society, like a lot of these numbers are kind of changing right now. You've, if you have some sort of spiritual bent or Christian, you sworn before God that you're going to take care of this person for the rest of your life. Uh, Till inconvenience do we part. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and um, uh, it's just not the feel good father way. Uh, it, it, it's not, secure it's not emotionally intelligent it's not pursuing peace um yeah there, there's not much more to say about it uh everything is is almost everything is reconcilable uh to a certain extent and um 
we're all here. We're all about figuring out a way to work, work through it, deal with your issues, develop some wisdom, create more peace in your life. And just recommit consistently to to your spouse, to your wife or your spouse, whatever it happens to be. Um, And your relationship will change. It's going to be hot and passionate when you're young. It's going to be completely different when you're older. Passion, that kind of stuff, as Adam, I think I just queued up Adam here for this part. It can be maintained throughout the piece. Let's talk about now. um, let's, Let's wrap up this thought, right? So we've had this huge shift about you're going to acknowledge my feeling. And so that's kind of the cultural zeitgeist. That everything's based on emotion. I think that just yeah. kind of led to this this idea that marriage is based on love, which we know is, as we've discussed, it's more on the partnership. It's more on yeah. who you're building, sort of the house of your family for for the rest of time. Uh, this gets into a lot of discussions we have here on Feel Good Fatherhood about generational legacy, gener- generational choices that you don't have to follow the pattern of your parents. That you can make your own choice, or if yeah. they're healthy and you like it, you can choose them. And as long as that's active. So, so now we're here, let's have a discussion about healing. Let's have a discussion for, for the fathers. What does this look like? Like, where do we start? What does it look like? Number one step, number one step is to hear about attachment because until you do, you don't realize there's an alternative out there. Your Mm -hmm. parents didn't teach you an alternative and you don't know one. Once you hear, Hey, this attachment thing, it exists. Then you go, Oh shoot. (laughs) That might be true. Anxious people will say, oh, thank God, it's not my fault. And they crave to learn more. Avoidant people will say, this sounds like a scam. And they'll wait and they'll learn about it. For, and they'll kind of like tiptoe around it like, an, like a nervous cat for about six months. And then they'll say, well, okay, maybe it's true. They, have, they, they take a little longer. That's okay. You learn about it. And then here's what you do. You make a decision. Are you miserable enough? in your life, earning approval from others, not being the man that you want, not living to your principles, your values, your honor code, feeling dishonorable, feeling alone, feeling afraid and powerless in this world, feeling very lonely. Even when you're with your partner and your kids and your family and your friends and everybody, you feel utterly alone. Are you miserable enough that you're willing to do things that are going to scare you? If so, here's what you do. You pick out your three core values that define you as a man. I want to qualify this just a little bit because I don't think that the only way to learn about this is through fear. If you're willing to commit and challenge yourself to grow in a way that's going to have a dramatic impact, not only in your personal Mm -hmm. quality of life, but the quality of life of your family Mm -hmm. and those of everybody around you, because we've we've just discussed on the show that attachment theory applies professionally, personally, romantically, parentally, um, and it goes up and down. Mm-hmm. That if you're willing to change, mm-hmm. right? If you're willing to just pursue that next step, this is mm-hmm. also an avenue available to you. I mm-hmm. Just keep going, keep going. Totally with you, totally with you. Um, the reason, the reason I take that tack usually, and that's that's a good qualification. The reason I usually take that tack is because um, it's it's going to be frightening. Mm. It's going to be frightening to do this work. You're going to have to make changes, and and your your brain, your limbic system, your emotional side brain are going to be screaming at you. Your amygdala responses are going to scream at you. You're going to have to learn to control that fear and that pain. And you're going to have to be in enough fear and pain now that says, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to live that way. And eventually over time, you will become, instead of pain focused and pain driven, more pleasure focused and pleasure driven. This will Mm. feel good. I want to grow, not hedonistic, but I want to grow. I want to thrive. I want to build my legacy. You will be there. Usually at first, your, your, your whole life is spent avoiding pain because you're afraid uh, it's going to destroy you. So if you are in enough pain and if you w- have enough hope, build hope. That's great. Stop and say, how do I make my decisions? Most mm-hmm. people, they, they, a decision point comes up, a conflict, a challenge point, and they say, um, what is going to minimize my pain? What's going to prevent mm-hmm. people from being mad at me? Well, it's going to stop people from hurting me. How do I stay safe? And they make their decisions that way. They lie. Mm-hmm. They cheat on a test or, you know, they, they steal something or they just don't give something back, which is stealing. Or they let somebody believe the, the wrong thing or they hold back on saying what they should say. They don't do the good things they should do and they do the bad things they shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. And they make choices that they come to hate. 
and they don't like themselves. Men know what honor is deep down. We honor code. The honor code is baked into our blood and our bones and our meat. It is not this old ancient like they invented honor. It's built into us. Men need to live our honor code. We need to live our principles. So you define your three core principles, your three values. Three. There you go. You got it. Three values that you may not live to now, but that mean the most to you. Where do you feel most ashamed when you violate them? Where would you feel most fulfilled when you stick to them? For me, I'll name my three. Make it easy. Honesty. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell a lie, but I also cannot let somebody else believe a lie. I need to give them the fullness of truth so everybody has access to truth so they can make their own decisions. Number two is integrity. I must keep my word. And even if someone else thinks I gave my word, I must still honor that responsibility mm. and be fulfill fulfilling to them so that they can trust me and trust other people. And number three is compassion. Mm. I must do what is truly right for those who are hurting, not enable them, but what's truly right for them. Those Absolutely are my three. Absolutely there's loyalty, it. right? There's loyalty. There's uh, courage. There's discipline. There's mo all kinds of other things that can really matter. Where are you most ashamed? Where can you not sleep at night if you break one? That tells you your top two, your top three. Um, where have you failed most in your life that you are most miserable about and has held you back the most? That's probably one of yours. Do you, Jay, do you know one of yours? Do you know, could you give us a couple of yours? I do. I've got all three. And here's where, here's where we'll go real quick. If this is a path that you're very interested in pursuing, there'll be a link in the bio, uh, the attachment bootcamp. Uh, you'll find that in the description. This is specifically, I think, the entry point. And I'm going to assume that these, this value exercise is something that mm -hmm. uh, our feel-good fathers can learn about in, in that bootcamp. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for, for calling out. Yeah. So the bootcamp is a course I put together with the 10 steps to fix your attachment. And this is one of the big ones at the beginning is fix it with yourself so you can gain self-respect and then other people can respect you too. Love it. Love it. Okay. Three values for, for Jay, feel good for mm -hmm. uh, freedom. Uh, we uh, don't have to do this just so much, but for me, uh, part of what I'm very sensitive to is not only am I myself acting on freedom, which is infinitely harder than most people make it out to be. It's incredibly difficult to be truly free. It but is. number two, I'm incredibly sensitive to when other folks are impinging on my freedom and restricting my choices. And that so when sense. that does occur, I am, I have a, I'm a very direct person. Um, I, I forget the specific term, but I'm uh, very direct. And so I call people out on that. I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to go a different tact. Mm -hmm. The next piece is responsibility. I feel a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction when, and this is directly aligned with freedom when I've made a choice or a high of responsibility over something and then I execute it and I'm able to run with it versus on the other time on, on the other side of it, it's like when I have no ownership of what's going on, when I have no influence of what's happening, I feel it in my bones. It's, it's, as you're describing, it feels powerless. It just, yeah. it sucks. I, I dislike it. Um, and then the third, my third value is authenticity. And this is, everything is very aligned, but it's being very true to myself. And yeah. so specifically on my journey, as I was leaving the video game world and moving into more of this personal branding, coaching, consulting, marketing space that I'm in today, it was very difficult for me because I didn't feel like I could live truly to myself, which is this geeky mythology, video gamey, pop culture movie guy, because Nobody in my new network cared or watched or consumed any of that content. And it took me definitely a couple of years to just be like, okay, you know, one of my favorite, one of my favorites, um, what I mean by okay is just like, all right, well, that's them. This is who I am. I have a tremendous amount of value to provide. Feel good fathers. You have a tremendous amount of value you can provide. And so for me, that authenticity of saying like, okay, well, I might not speak specifically in, um, uh, postgraduate degree manner, or I might, I definitely don't always speak in a high business proficiency style. Like I don't speak, um, uh, um, it, I don't speak that language all the time, but I, I do speak mythology. I do speak character. I do speak movie. I do speak, um, you know, uh, face of a thousand masks. Like I, I do speak in these different terms and I can talk about the hero's journey and I can talk mm -hmm. about these different kind of elements. Um, because it's just a great way for me to be authentic in who I am. And that's what people want and desire. And so how do I know, uh, this is another one of 
uh, feel good father's core principles is that your emotional resonance and what's happening inside your body is going to tell you whether or not you're living within uh, your value set. And to me that I, 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 I recognize this most is that having a low resonance, a low frequency has a specific mm -hmm. emotional profile, fear, disgust, withdrawn, um, ends up in anger and it's kind of a little bit more energetic, mm -hmm. but what's weird about higher, I think of being more aligned, we'll use that language of being more aligned with your emotion and your values. Mm -hmm. That side is more peace, joy, contentment. It's a much more temperate feeling. It's yes. not the crazy exuberance and crazy stuff like that. I, I specifically don't think that's true for men. I think that men are at their best when we're calm on the inside, we're rooted, we're the tree trunk that is grounded around us, providing mm. shade for the people that we care about, mm. providing fruits of our of the labor of the growth, uh, and just um, that's kind of the feel good fatherhood way: freedom, responsibility, authenticity. I love that. That's our ancestors would have called this our honor code. Mm. Their honor code. Every man has honor, and that's it. You have your honor code. I have mine. Every man has to define that and then start living to it. When we make a decision, do you want to dishonor yourself out mm. of fear and avoidance of pain and appeasing others? Or do you want to keep your honor intact and sleep at night and be at peace with yourself? And the more that you make those decisions, the better off you're going to be and the more you're going to attract people who value you for upholding your, your principles because they make you trustworthy. They make you reliable. They make you consistent. They make you, they make your wife trust you. They make your kids trust you because mm. you define yourself. They don't have to wonder what you're going to do when a crisis hits. They say, what is the most honest thing daddy could do? Oh, well, that's what he'll do. Daddy mm. will always be honest. What's the most, what's the thing that daddy, what would, what would make daddy protect my freedom and, and be authentic with me? They don't ever have to wonder, is dad being authentic? No, they know. Is dad going to shackle me to the wheel and make me do things I hate? No, dad values honesty. Dad would never do that to you. They mm. can trust you. They can trust you. And so, you can trust you. Love it. So we were at this point where you've started this attachment journey. You're consuming it. You participated in the boot camp. Maybe you mm -hmm. haven't. We talked a little bit about some of the tendencies of mom and what she might be doing in this world spousal as well. What can we see and what do we see in our children? So if mm. we're paying attention, we're watching our children, we're helping them do their thing. Mm. What, what can we see? Like how is attachment, uh, insecure attachment going to manifest in their behaviors? Yeah. Let's talk about the really quick. I'll, I'll give you a throw out like some of the top pieces that can cause it so people know what to look for for inciting events in their kids and then some symptoms to look for so inciting events baby boy born, born uh, early and in the NICU for a while NICU is is a horrible horrible for attachment um, baby in daycare way too early and for a long periods of time is really a red flag really mm -hmm. red flag some families have to do this for various financial reasons but that could be a giant red flag baby with medical concerns after birth uh, especially painful ones or ones where they're removed from you for a while surgeries things like that um baby who's sick a lot mom and dad who are stressed out and arguing a lot mom who is depressed a lot postpartum mom needs to be mirroring correctly facial features for the baby and the baby's born with amygdala and mirroring neurons and those are the two brain structures really formed at birth everything else starts to form after that but baby starts trying to get mom to react and if mom's not reacting well baby starts wondering why and starts trying to figure it out cause and effect with a very limited brain it doesn't go well um abuse of any kind uh negligence of any kind um anything trauma it, but it, it can also just be you guys having broken attachment where you don't know how to give Secure attachment, that's the thing, is it's not just the things that you do wrong. You could try to do nothing wrong and you would be blank and you would still get it wrong because you're not doing the good things that you missed. You don't know the gaps that you have. Once you fix your attachment, you start seeing the gaps and filling them. But the best parent in the world who has anxious attachment is still going to struggle because you don't know the good things. You don't know the gaps that you're missing. You just won't because you haven't seen that modeled yet. But filling in the gaps is really important. So if you or your wife have attachment issues, it's very high likelihood that your children will as well. Um, what is that? Go ahead. Go ahead. If you're a lot of fathers today, 
don't have a good model for secure attachment. And yeah. so I, I have another colleague who's in a, she's currently a psychotherapist. She's kind of doing this kind of stuff. And we were talking about how at a certain age, age range, if you had something traumatic happen to you at say six, when your child is six, there's, there, there might be something manifest in the way that you treat them because you had something missing. And so I'm projecting out into feel good fathers that are on this journey of improving. They're trying to figure out how to be the best parent they can be. Mm. If they have no model, they're certainly not going to get it from Hollywood. That that's just true. They're not going to see positive attachment from Hollywood, not in a consistent manner. Mm. How do we, how do we learn what, like what to do sort of in a day-to-day format um, to do the best possible? The male brain is weird. It is designed to be one data node on a network of data nodes that share information about solving problems. And mm. so many of us are completely disconnected from that network. We are a single little data node trying to solve every problem in the world all over again. We're trying to invent fire, invent the spear, invent the wheel, invent the wall, build a house. We're trying to recreate everything. You need to plug into the healthy, data network where all the other data nodes are sharing solutions. That's part of what this podcast is. Right. We click in and it ripples through and all these solutions ripple through every guest you have on. It ripples through the network of data that all those independent data nodes out there, all you guys listening are picking up all this data. So the more data you gather and filter, filter correctly, and the more that you can verify it with other data nodes and see the truth and make sure you're connecting to a secure network, not a broken network. Mm. That's what you came from was a broken network. That's why you splintered off and you're alone. But connect to a good network that you trust and verify the information coming in. That's how you gather these models. You learn it from watching fathers, watching dads, parent. You learn it from talking to other dads and you learn it from sitting down and asking, hey, Adam, what does a typical day look like in a mm. loving household? Hey, Adam, what does it look like to navigate bedtime with a difficult child who doesn't want to go to sleep with secure attachment? I get these questions a lot on parenting podcasts and from my clients that I coach and from Mm. people. I got a private community. I get questions every single day from those people. Hey, Adam, what should I do here? Hey, Adam, what does this look like? Hey, just ask. Mm. That's that's my job is to provide that endless supply, but it's also other parents' job. It's, it's a therapist's job. It's a priest's job. It's, it's, you you know, your, your uncle's job. If he's a good uncle, data notes. Remember data nodes and click into the right networks. That's the answer here. Got it. Got it. So the other major, major facet, we've talked about this a whole bunch of times on the show, is your marital relationship, right? You've got this great book. Um, I've read it. I'm a huge fan. Can we have, um, of this book in particular, It I, I had the audio version. I was listening to it with my wife. We were kind of discussing everything as it was kind of coming up and just kind of mm-hmm. learning together, which I thought was mm-hmm. fantastic. Mm-hmm. Can we have a brief um, summary of exhausted wives, bewildered husbands, what it kind of goes over, and then right talk up about, head, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do that, and then I'll do question two later. <laughs> cool. It's right up there above my head. That's what I was pointing at. Um, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands is based on my years as a licensed marriage and family therapist. The number one issue of why a wife will divorce you at 10, 15, 20 years, why marriages fall apart, right? Why guys go on the internet and say, I was blindsided. All the horror stories on the internet about your awful wife. Um, What that comes from is dad has avoidant attachment. Mom has anxious attachment. Mom's approval seeking and doesn't ask for her needs to get met. Dad is emotionally distant, not a jerk, but just distant and just doesn't know how to connect. And they can get along until they have kids. Then mom floods with oxytocin at birth and through breastfeeding and says, I want my children to be loved and cared for and safe and comfortable and joyful in their relationships. And then dad becomes enemy number one because dad doesn't change. Mom hormonally starts changing and says, something is wrong here. The attachment is off. She doesn't know the words. Something is wrong here and they need more connection from dad. And then she starts pressing on him to do more, which feels weird to him and uncomfortable. And he doesn't know what she wants. So over time, they start falling apart. He starts becoming the enemy. The kids are nervous and anxious because they're not getting their needs met as much from him emotionally. He doesn't know how to do that. He's trying. He's doing everything he can. Mom gets more and more angry and resentful. And eventually it just shreds the marriage. 
destroys the marriage. Mm. So fixing that comes down to number one, dad learning about attachment. It must come from the father. And then number two, dad fixing his relationship with the kids and building it. So it's incredible. What this does is number one, it, de it, it stops all of the bleed effect and all of the, the fighting and frustrations you guys are experiencing. Uh, she has no more reason to complain about you, but it also turns you into an amazing, powerful agent in your family of growth and health and love and nurturing and strength. And so she craves to keep you around at this point. And it flips her opinion of you when the kids are singing your praises and thriving. Now she she is open to loving you again because she doesn't have to kill her love for you out of protection for her kids. Then she starts wanting that emotional intimacy with you. And now you've practiced building it with your kids. You build it with her too. And the marriage thrives. I've worked so many couples through this process. It's not even funny. But when you follow that pathway, just about almost every marriage can be fixed when you follow that pathway. Love it. I, I, I think back to early early childhood with my, my eldest daughter, mm. how I was probably this avoidant attachment early on. But I think a unique thing happened that kind of forced me to address some of this stuff was that uh, my wife was working nights and some weekends. And so oh. I was forced to raise, like I taught my daughter how to cook. I taught her how to do the laundry. It was Everything. her and I for at least four to five nights of the week, just us together making sure she had bath time, getting to bed, reading books, doing stuff. I dropped her off at daycare. I picked her up, like mm -hmm. everything, like cooking. And we just spent, like we spent all night together, like for about about a year and a half, just yeah. constantly. And that like, I was like, oh, as you were talking, I was reflecting on my own journey. I was like, that was probably the inciting incident where I was like, oh, I figured this kind of thing out. Yes. And, and my eldest is like, you know, we're two peas in a pod. It's, it's amazing. It's really great. We've done a reasonable amount of discussion on the past, where things come from, industrial revolution that completely mm -hmm. aligns with like my theory of what happened to the family unit. Mm -hmm. Why are we in the state that we are today? I knew like I knew kind of instinctually it had to be around all these wars, but I hadn't aligned it to um, what was it? Suburban flight or I, I forget mm -hmm. what the specific term is called. I hadn't mm -hmm. aligned that. What a great learning um, to sort of in the present, what it can look like when it's insecure and we need to do some work on attachment to secure an attachment. Let's, let's now do some future facing sort of our final as we're wrapping. What does the state of fatherhood with this kind of stuff addressed look like to you? Mm. Fatherhood is more important than it has ever been. It's not that it ever was unimportant. Fatherhood is most important during times of pain and struggle. I tell people that we are all living in the rubble of a better culture, and we are trying to build. Gen Z was born into rubble. They were born into the woods, ivy growing over the rubble. They are wandering in the woods trying to find people to love. It's, it's young men and women out in the woods stumbling upon each other and say, Hi, can we be family? And they're just completely terrified of each other. Fatherhood has, has, I'm not going to say it has never been more important than it is now. It's not quite right, but the shattering of everything. Father's job is to provide physically safety, resources, food, shelter, and emotionally safety, nurturing, stability, so that somebody can rely upon you. You need to provide both of those. It's not enough to be a social worker. You can't hand them a check and say, all right, you're fed. You must provide stability and safety and cooperation and skills and nurturing and all of that in this world, or they will be launched into the world of rubble and predators and, and people who just hurt each other out of fear. Because it's not, it's not that everyone out there is evil. It's that everybody out there is terrified and they don't know how to live. And if you are a father, the number one thing you can do to make an impact on this world is not to become king or a warlord over a territory or cure cancer. It is to raise human beings who are capable of cooperating and building what comes next. Because we cannot have rubble for the next five generations. Raise builders and cooperators and thrivers. Don't raise survivors. Don't just do that. Raise people who thrive. The future belongs to those who show up. 
help your kids show up by showing up yourself. Adam, this has been fantastic. I, I really love this vision. I really love the fact that, um, what was implied and what I took from that is, is that similar message is that when we today as feel good fathers take ownership, take that responsibility for what's happening in our life and happening for our family, we are literally creating a ripple effect effect on everything and everyone. We're creating the foundation. We are, um, in essence, maybe not specifically building that future, but creating that solid ground on which the future is built. Yes. Absolutely love it. Um, I love the image of the rubble. We have to clear the rubble of the hurt and the pain and the poor attachment styles and, and the trauma and all the other kind of stuff that's going on and just clear it out, do the hard work that we're capable of doing and, and build a better future. If folks really want to get a hold of you and they want to follow what you're doing, I know I'm already mm -hmm. following you, but why don't we let Feel Good Fathers know where that is? Great. So all of my resources and, and contacting me and everything is available on adamlanesmith.com. I've got downloads on there. I've got coaching. I have a private community with group coaching events. It's very affordable for anyone who's, who's worried your budget won't con conform to it. Yeah, it will. We, we got you. I got you. We have everything you need. I'm on YouTube where I've got over 400 free video guides on there as well that you can check out and learn. I do live events on there Tuesdays and, and Wednesday nights. You can join me there. I'd love to talk to you. I'm on Instagram if you prefer static images or short reels. I'm on Instagram at attachment Adam. Very shareable material that you can pass off to your buddies or pass off to your wife or just bookmark so you have it for the future. You want to learn? I am here to help you. Thank you. Adam Lane Smith, everybody. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for being here today with us and for taking the time to spend this time learning with us. If this was helpful, and I know it was, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything that's coming your way. You want to be the father who shows up? It's time to show up. Fantastic and great message. Right here is that next video. YouTube in all of its thing has said this video with this awesome thumbnail is the next one you should watch. It's probably one of mine. I think it is. If it is, you're going to get a lot of value from it. Thanks for tuning in.